co-conspirator. I like that. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Saida, welcome. We're so happy to have you here with us for our Wednesday Reflections. Saida Segovia Taylor has 25 years of experience connecting opportunities with Black and Latino youth and families in Chicago. She prides herself on being a social justice advocate by promoting the oneness of humankind, environmental justice, and physical and spiritual health. Saida is the new founder and executive director of a nonprofit called Organic Oneness, established in 2020. And together with her nine board members, countless volunteers, and a multitude of community partners, they promote the interconnectedness of all people and the earth through community trainings, programs, and events. Organic Oneness is also building structures to help social activists prevent illness, burnout, and compassion fatigue. I think that a lot of people um, in this particular Zoom room might uh, identify with. So we are so happy that you are uh, joining us, Saida, for this um, talk that we are calling Translating Love into Action. And uh, we are so happy to have you and we welcome you now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is truly an honor. Um, to, to share what has been happening, I in no way would call myself an expert in this because if I knew what I was doing, I would have all the answers and there would be peace on earth. However, we are <laughs> in the practice of trying to attain that. And so I will share my experience, not to say that it's the end all be all, it's the only way to do it, but I'm just gonna share some common things that I've seen um, that might be helpful, might not. So <laughs> whatever you see um, fits or you're able to do, please, by all means, use it. If not, toss it to the side and keep moving because <laughs> we all have special gifts. We all have our own way of seeing things. We all have different things to contribute to this process. So my way what I've experienced might be completely different from what you've experienced. And I think that's the beauty, beauty in this, is that we're having a dialogue of what we're experiencing so that we can continue to grow towards a peaceful society. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm just going to go over to my uh, slide. Now bear with me. This is the icebreaker part where you get to see me fumble and fall completely as I try to transition to, to a PowerPoint. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, so I'm sharing my whole screen. And that's the first step. Now per play. And I still see you guys. Okay. All right. Thank you. And you can hear me okay. Thumbs up. Everyone's good. All right. So translating love into action. Um, and this term actually comes from the Baha'i faith. Uh, and I just think it's so beautiful because yeah, how do we translate love into action? Uh, because we can say that we love each other all day long as I do with my husband, but as we find time and time again, we don't understand one another and we end up <laughs> in just the quarrel and you know, we're, we're not always connected. So what does it mean to love? Um, as you explained before, Organic Oneness is a grassroots social justice organization that co-creates, that's a key word, with communities to mobilize systemic change, healing and wellness, foregrounding, another key thing, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. So we work with everyone, but for the purposes of uh, helping Black, Indigenous, and people of color, as we all know, um, that's where the inequities lie. So who am I? Who is Saida? So I am a social justice advocate. You will find me at marches. You will find me giving talks. Um, this is my immediate family with my daughter of 21. Oh, she's now 22 years old. Um, my husband of 23, his parents, my parents, and my brother who recently got married and this is their extended family. I love plants. So when you hear me talk about health, I'm always talking about our interconnectedness with plants and how they help reduce stress, our cortisol uh, 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 levels and all kinds of stuff. Uh, the picture on the bottom, I do like to indulge in taking pictures when there's a given moment. Um, and uh, I used to uh, be um, 
uh, back, uh, 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 what is it when you're in a movie, but you're in the background, you're uh, extra, extra. So <laughs> I always like to have fun with that. Um, I'm a member of the Baha'i Faith. And in Chicago, I'm part of the local spiritual assembly of the Baha'is of Chicago. So that's a nine member elected administrative body. So I'm a part of that as the vice chair. Um, another part of health and wellness, you can find on YouTube channel, me talking about the nutritional value of fruits and vegetables and how we have to be intentional with what we're eating so that our bodies can function the way we need it to. And then what helped me go into a deep dive of nutrition and wellness, I am a cancer survivor, a breast cancer survivor. Uh, I was diagnosed in 2008, had a mastectomy, chemo, radiation, five years of tamoxifen, multitude of surgeries uh, and reconstructive surgery. And that saga has uh, pushed me into a different direction. Um, it's definitely not the end of the saga because I have a lot of things that I have to do to prevent that from happening again. Um, and that's where all the lessons come in so that you don't have to go through what I went through. Uh, let's see, let's go to, so the work of organic oneness and everything that I do in terms of just a human being, and I try to implement it in the organization, are part of two quote, quotes that are from the Baha'i writings. We belong to an organic unit, and when one part of the organism suffers, the rest of the body will feel its consequence. And the other one, uh oh, where's the other one? Okay, there it is. And the other quote is where, oh, sorry, where there is love, nothing is too much trouble and there is always time. So it's amazing how when we love something, we will find time for it. So we always have to question, what is it that we love? And so um, the talk today, I know in the caption or the blurb that went out was, how do we take the, the, the idea of love and action and change it from just a thought amongst a few to a large amount with a lot of organizations? And so I'm going to use this event as an example, Bikes, Birds, and Environmental Justice, and what our process was, because um, it was doing this event that helped me understand what is our process, because we move along through life just acting and responding and carrying things out, but we don't really analyze like, oh, in the morning, I wake up and I like coffee because I need energy. You know, like we don't analyze it. We just do it. Um, and so this helped me figure out, like, what is it that we do? What is the process? Um, and so these three organizations here that's on the flyer, that's what we started off with. And by the end, when we actually had the event, we had all of these organizations. So how do you go from three to all of this? And that's building collaboration. That's understanding who are the key partners. And let's see if this works. No, it doesn't work. Okay, so I'm gonna have to come out of this because I wanna show just a quick example of, uh, I wanna, how do I get out of here? You can still see me, right? Okay, all right. So I wanna come out of here. Okay, here we go, here we go. But you can't see my screen anymore, right? Okay, all right, so let's share again. Okay, so this, some of you have might've seen this before. But it's an excellent, and tell me if you could hear it. I just want a thumbs up. If you you've hear learned it? a lot about leadership and making okay. a movement, then let's watch. All right, so this video demonstrates how you take or like what actions or things you should be aware of in terms of getting bigger and bigger. Um, and I, and I, I was really interested in this when I saw it. Um, so if you've seen this before, I for, I, I'm, I'm asking for forgiveness and patience through it. But if you haven't seen this, um, I think you'll like it at the end. The movement happens start to finish in under. Okay. All right. 
If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute, you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, Remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. So that that really resonated um, the first time I saw this video. Uh, and I saw it when I was getting my master's at uh, Loyola in community development and social justice. And that was one of the moments that I said, huh, yeah, I don't really, I'm really not that first person. Sometimes I am, I'll say an idea and I let that idea dwindle if nobody comes to my side and and is that second person or that third person comes to my side and I noticed that pattern in what i've been doing and what others have been doing. And so when when i'm involved with different Community action councils or you know different committees or different groups. I kind of take a step back and see what everybody else is saying, and if it aligns with me i'm that second person and saying, okay, you guys, you know, oh yeah, that's a good idea. And I help that other person with their ideas. And so when people call me a leader or, you know, the organic oneness is doing great stuff, I have to take a step, I said, it's not really us, you know, it's a collective because not one person can do it alone, not one entity can do it alone. So how are you aligning yourself with, what is actually happening in the communities and what do you care about? Uh, so here, uh oh, I lost you all. I don't know where you went. I tried to go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so uh, let's do this again, share. All right, so, okay, play. No, that's not what I, okay, y'all, I should test you. Who, who knows what's this? <laughs> Okay, so so how do we go from those three to the others? We looked at the, and so the process of bikes, birds, and environmental justice, um, the ones highlighted in purple are me, 
and the other colors are the other folks. So environmental list of color, which are in the orange, that's who I had a relationship with. And we have the intersection of environmental uh, issues and challenges and heading towards justice. And in their network, they knew equiticity. And so they said, oh, you guys both just did a bike ride. You should meet each other. And so we met each other. So this was our event. This was their event. And because environmentalists of color has such a large network, they really understand what's going on in BIPOC communities. And so when I say BIPOC, that's Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And so they're, they're a networking agency um, that's truly fabulous. Um, so they said, oh, you both just had bikes. You know, you should meet each other. And so then we had another event with environmentalists of color. They had an event with environmentalists of color. And then that's when we all met and understood our intersectionalities. And so when we met, we said, hmm, it's just a getting to know you meeting, you know, and a lot of us know about one on ones and just figuring out who is it that you are, you know, what is, what is it that uh, intersects with what I do. And so when we met on, uh, uh, on Zoom, unfortunately, we started talking about the different things that we did and that we stood for. And so it was environmental and racial justice, mobility, community building, education and advocacy. So just through our normal conversations, just, oh, and what else have you done? And what have you experienced? All of this kind of came out. Um, and so then, you know, we, between the three organizations, we said, okay, bikes, would be a good idea to do together because we're all interested in that. And then birds, looking at the environment, and then uh, environmental justice. And so, so we said, okay, well, yeah, let's let's do an event together. This would be great, you know. Um, and so, um, our organizing process usually, when you get to that level of uh, of of creating an event, you usually start off with how much money do we have? Okay, what are the resources? Who's gonna take charge? Who's gonna do the agenda? Who's gonna, you know, and that's not how we started at all. What we started with was, let's have another conversation and let's get to know each other. What have your struggles been? Um, and it was that, that, that process. And so it goes back to um, what do I have to contribute in, in my own self-love? Uh, and and then it started from my own self-love and wanting for better people uh, to creating a culture of care in our meetings. And so we'd always start off with, how's your day been? It's a, a, a check-in, you know, oh, what, how's work? How's your family? How's the, you know, it was very relational. Um, and in that I got to appreciate myself, and appreciate everyone else who was in the room and we created a culture of care and so that was that became the utmost importance we didn't even get into technical tactical planning until we all were present and everything that was weighing us down was lifted and so sometimes the majority of our meetings were just kind of unloading you know um and so through that unloading, we, we built our relationship up and then we got to the tactical part. What is it that we wanna do? Um, oh, and you can't see, oh, you can't see my pictures. Can you see, you only see one picture, don't, oh man. Okay, well, the first thing was self-love. Um, and so just learning, like we all carry our baggage. We never came to the meetings as if we were better than anyone else. And we understood our worth, but it didn't take a ranking above anybody else. And so in our paint and everything that we acknowledged who we were as human beings and everything that we had to offer. Oh, there it is. Look at that. Okay. And so we learned about that through texting each other, through having uh, 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 unpacking what we've experienced in terms of um, oppression and making sure that we rested. Uh, and so we just did a lot of sharing. Uh, and that can, and more relationship building. So through the text, it changed into from like, oh, when is our next meeting? Um, which is traditionally what you text your colleagues about um, to just, 
hey, this is what happened to me yesterday. And oh, you like that music? Oh, I, yeah, I used to be a DJ in college. Oh, man, I was a part of the dance major. And then we got into the history of who we were um, and, and our in our life. And um, let's see. And then through that came th the, the tactical planning. So when we were able to really understand and trust each other, then we got into the, to the, the logistics. Okay, what is it that we want to do? What does our community need? What are the, the, what's the budget? What time and location? So all of that, which traditionally <laughs> in our workplace comes first, you know, here are our goals, these are resources, let's move forward. That came last. And so, you know, then we just said, okay, who has what? We looked at our assets. And when we didn't have something that we needed to get the vision done for what our communities needed, then we pulled in other people from our network. Say, oh, you know what? We need, we need liability insurance. This other organization that also believes in the same things that we're talking about, they might want to join this. And so each of us that were in the current call started thinking about our network and our friends and everybody else that we've worked with that had certain assets that, that can contribute to the project. Uh, and so then it just grew. So our love was contagious. So what we started off with, it was really Amaris, which is my board member here and uh, advisor of uh, environmentalists of color, uh, start a conversation with me saying, hey, you need to know Obai and I'll introduce you to Asia. So this was our first meeting. Then from that meeting, we said, oh, you know who else would be uh, interested? Obai said, um, this guy, Phil, that I work with. And then um, Asia said, yeah, um, Carolina would be really interested in this too. So our next meeting grew to this. And then it just kept growing each meeting, getting new and new people. So to the point, and all the members aren't even in this last picture here, but we had over 19 organizations just because in each meeting, we said, who else would like to be a part of this? Who else can contribute to this? And we just made every meeting an open space, a very transparent space you know, we weren't embarrassed about our budget. We weren't, in, which we started off with zero, and and, um, and 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 we just continued moving forward. And then, uh, you know, people were like, "Oh, I have uh, a, a connection with I with WTTW. Oh, and we should do this." So even in our marketing, it was still a collaborative. You know, like who is in your network? Who should know about this? And we were able to cover so much media. Um, with just reaching out to friends and taking just a, a, a little lift, but it was all of us taking that little lift together that created this huge thing that happened. And so at the end, um, we kind of evaluated because somebody else wanted us to present on like, oh, how did you make this happen? Because at the, at the, uh, um, at the uh, event, you just felt love. It was pure love. You, whoever walked into the space, and we had about 150 people that day riding bikes. We had lunch for everyone um, and music in the park. And, and so whoever entered that space felt the love that we each had for ourselves and for each other. Uh, and so that day became a, a culture of care. Uh, and, and then um, from my studies. <laughs> this was something that I pulled up uh, that I said, okay, this is what we did without even knowing it, without even planning, just having the respect, mutual respect and understanding um, for each other. We did this, which was we, we, we understood the importance of autonomy, which is the desire to make your own choices and control your own fate. We, whoever entered the space, it wasn't about what you needed to do for us. It was what can you contribute and what would you like to contribute? You know, how do you see this shaping out? And then appreciation, the desire to be recognized and valued. So all of us long for that. So why wouldn't we do that to each other? So we always appreciated each other. Um, and even when we couldn't make meetings, we said, you know, just rest, be with your family. That's so great. 
instead of why didn't you make this meeting? Oh, this isn't important to you. You don't want to make the time. It was no, whenever you're here, we didn't even have a, a set chair or secretary or treasurer and all these traditional roles. We opened our meeting with, okay, who wants to take notes? All right, what should we put on our agenda today to talk about? And then everybody contributed. Who wants to lead the meeting? Who has the energy to lead the meeting today? And then we just rotated who did that. Affiliation, number three, the desire to belong as an accepted member of the group. Number four, the role, the desire to have a meaningful purpose. And number five, status, the desire to feel fairly seen and acknowledged. And so many times that I talk to people, they, uh, they leave a workplace or they leave a project because one of those five core values was crossed. Either they weren't acknowledged, they weren't appreciated, they weren't able to contribute the way they wanted, and their role was, wasn't satisfactory or meaningful. And so when one of those five things is crossed, that's when you run into conflict or burnout or compassion fatigue or people leaving. Um, so it's important to maintain those five uh, things um, in order to create this movement for everyone. Uh, in addition to a lot of other stuff, but those were some of the things that uh, came up. So I guess this is time for questions. Um, and I didn't look at the chat at all. So <laughs> I'll need help. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. This is an opportunity now, um, friends, to engage with Saida. There were a number of comments, Saida, in the chat um, uh, when you were talking about leaders and the willingness to look ridiculous and be up and, and people to be first follower. People were putting some names of some religious figures in there. I saw Paul put in for people of Christian background. Buddha was put in there. Um, I was thinking about that too. Like I was thinking about from my Christian perspective, the disciples and like the first follower and the second follower and then other people following. So I thought that was that was interesting um, for those of us from various religious traditions to think about how that leadership, um, the way that you described it, plays out in, in our stories. Um, Catherine, I wonder if you'd like to talk a little bit because um, you had some comments in the chat. Um, Saida, thank you so much for your your work and your sharing with us. Um, uh, I, a lot of what you were saying was really resonating with me. Um, among other things, especially I think COVID um, and the situations we've had to deal with and dealing with everything, um, you know, so much in virtual reality. Um, a number of the groups that I'm in have gotten incredibly task oriented. Um, and um, I, you, you were putting words to the process I'm going through, basically thinking that I'm not sure I want to remain at this table anymore mm. because there's that, you know, they get on and they're like, okay, you know, what was, did you do this? Did you do that? And I'm like going, could you say hello? And there's a face at the table I don't recognize or someone's been missing for, you know, three meetings. Can we check in with them? Um, they're getting so task oriented that I'm actually questioning, is this the place I need to be putting my energy? Um, and you were putting into words part of what that feeling is that or that need inside of me is not just to get the task done, um, but it's to build more bridges while we get the task done. Um, so thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for that feedback. It's always affirming to hear how others are hearing it. So I appreciate that. Thank you. I would also say, I, I totally agree. And I love that, Catherine, about um, what you're drawing up and what you, of course, spoke of, Saida, with building relationship first and all the benefits that come from that. I also had a thought, and I, I, maybe it's just been because I posted something on my social media and I'm aware of it. Um, on the flip of that, the reverse side of having the, the like the video, I love the video. It's great. I loved everything they said about that. But it's like, what, what if the lone nut is somebody we don't want to follow? 
and how the power, so I'm thinking, you know, I immediately go to Trump and what happened if we hadn't followed, you know, if there had been more pushback right away, you know, what would have, and then I just read this article um, on Matt Gates, I think in the New York Times, where uh, they were calling um, on men to, like, that, that if somebody had, when he showed the first nude in Congress, that if somebody had said, that's not okay, Matt, you need to be better. And that he wouldn't have gotten that affirmation, he wouldn't have become, he maybe wouldn't have been elected to Congress, da, 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 all the things that would have. So the power we have to be that first follower or to not be that first follower was, was kind of ringing true for me. I don't know if you want to respond to that or have anything to add to that. Yeah, no, no, that is, that is very true. You know, is, um, it, we definitely have power where we put our energy. Uh, and we give power to 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 the energy. Um, and so if we and that's where we have to be courageous, we have to either stand up or move away um, and encourage others to move away. Uh, and so you still like there is movement that you're doing. You just have to be super intentional in how you're using your energy um, and how you're being present. Uh, so if there is somebody that is not doing good, yeah, then are you going to be that first leader to stand up against and and start another movement so that this kind of dwindles? And, 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 and another technique that is used is that say I'm going to a meeting or something's about to happen and I know who's in the room and I know how they're gonna respond. I know how, what they're up, you know, what, they're, what they stand for. So what I do is I develop relationships outside of the meeting and I find who is like-minded like me. And so then before we go into the meeting, I have a pre-meeting with them. And I say, you know what, so-and-so this is what they're going to push. This is their agenda. This is what they're going to say. And I noticed that the three of us are like-minded and here's the power of three. You got to get three people. So in the meeting, I strategically place, you sit over there, you sit over there. And, and when, when they bring this up on the agenda, I'm going to say this, but right after I say that, I need you to back me up. I need you to say what you believe in that coincides with this. And after you say that, you third person immediately jump in and say what you believe in also. And so from us being in different parts of the room um, and responding that way, it shifts the power automatically. Now, if you are sitting with your friends and the three of you are saying the same thing, it doesn't have the same impact because it's like, oh, that's how they think. Oh, they hang around each other all the time and whatever. And, you know, that's the click. And so if you spread it out um, and you sit in different spots of the room and you say it, then it feels like the whole room is against that thought. And so the pressure amongst everybody else will jump in and agree um, unless there's another thought. And, you know, but that's that's the that's the the tricky part with power and understanding and how to shift it. Uh, I don't use that often, um, but when there are people that need to be overtaken like that, then then there are techniques to um, to use. Uh, to kind of create an illusion of like, this is not good and this is not okay. I was just thinking that that to a certain extent is um, where that bridge building first, where that learning about people first is so helpful uh, because first of all, you get, uh, I would imagine that for many people and still um, uh, some of our most recent but now past leadership looked very good on paper. There were skill levels there, there were gifts there that looked really great on paper, but the fall down was how those gifts were presented into the world um, and, and the goal 
of that, you know, of people, you know, just because they have great gifts and great contacts, but what is their, their goal in, in being in that space um, that, you know, can be really important. And, and that's part of where I think the learning about the people first um, yeah. is, is really pretty crucial because that's where you get to know whether this is, um, you know, again, where you want to stay, where you want to put your energy, where you want to be present. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, I saw just briefly, somebody said it's hard to do that in a uh, virtual world. Um, yeah, it, it is because you can't place where your faces are. Um, but it does go back to what Reverend Catherine was saying is that, you know, you have to get to know each other. And so just in your in your spaces, um, when you do hold a meeting, what I've seen work just to get to know each other is there is a speed round um, so that people are split off in different rooms, smaller rooms, and there's like a guiding question so that people can get to know each other. Um, but then you can also take ownership also and say, you know, hey, so I'll just use Alex as, as an example. I'll chat to him. Hey, Alex, I liked your comments you know, I, I believe in the same things. Can we have a one on one? Because I really want to dig deeper into your thoughts on what was said. And so then Alex and I would set a time separately from this meeting to really understand each other. So pay attention in that this is where emotional intelligence kicks in is that, you know, pay attention, you know, you could still read the room of on zoom, you can see, you know, how people are nodding, you know, what, what they really lean into, what they respond to, and take those cues and act on it. You know, oh, I saw your head nod on this. You know, what can you tell me what your thoughts were? Or, you know, I, I saw that you were interrupted. Uh, how can I help next time um, you get your, your point across? Because I thought that was keen what you were saying. You know, so still, read the room it's important you know and, and i know there are different reasons of why some people don't have their camera on but even dig into that a little bit more you know hey i noticed that you don't have your camera on on every meeting is there a reason for that do you not feel comfortable in the room you know is there like is there something that i can assist with so that you know or, or if it's personal i totally understand and you don't have to share you know, but but it's that reaching out and that relationship building that we have to take ownership over ourselves um, in, in order to understand who, who you're in the room with. And perhaps it's more important in these virtual times. And hard. Yeah. Yeah. And we can easily say, you know, uh, you know, things aren't normal, but what if this is our new way of being in life you know we have to figure out how to continue building relationships so side i've been thinking about um uh what i see as kind of a parallel way of of doing this work that that you've been demonstrating for us and first of all i really want to thank you for um, coming and just being a holistic person with us. I loved the slide that said something about who you are. Who you are. Um, we've been doing these Wednesday reflections for more than a year and we've had a lot of guest speakers. No one has done that. Um, we jump into like our work because, you know, we're asking you to come here and, and, and share one particular facet of yourself, but it's not true that the rest of you isn't also in the room, as they say, or in the Zoom room, right? Um, and so I really appreciate that sort of holistic, you are a wider person than just the work that you do. And I loved that introductory piece. And then I was thinking, I, I feel like there's a parallel also with in the example that you gave of organizing for this event, you know, you started with a few people with four of you at the table and asking who else should be here, who else should be here. And as I was looking at the wide list of partners and sponsors or whatever that you had by the end of it, there are a lot of kind of unlikely partners on there, right? There are some social justice organizations, there's some community organizations, there's some fundraising groups, there's some faith-based groups. It's not all just in one segment. And I feel like for us in institutions or whatever, we tend to like partner with those organizations that make sense, that are like us, right? So like 
oh, well, we're a graduate school of theology, like let's look to other graduate schools to do partnerships with, or we're affiliated with the United Church of Christ, let's do stuff with our UCC partners. Um, uh, or even just, you know, in the interreligious work, like let's just find other, other faith traditions and do something with them, but not always thinking about, well, who are the other community partners and who are the people and who's, what about the school system? And what about all of these other things? And I feel like that was a really, um, similarly like to you being a whole person, that was a way of engaging the whole, the entirety of the holistic community as opposed to just one segment from it. And I, I don't know, I just, I had that thought and I, I wonder if you could comment a little bit about that and if, if you see that as intentional or like how, how does that, how does that work for you? Yeah, so it, it, it's definitely intentional, but it's not thought of. <laughs> <laughs> because, because it's usually just who do you know, you know, who's in your network and and creating an atmosphere that it does embrace all of you, you know, like I'm a mother, you know, oh, there are other mothers that I run into at my daughter's school and knowing their interests, you know, it, it just uh, and then they're knowing their religious backgrounds and knowing, you know, where they're from and knowing. So, so it's always about looking at the intersectionality of things. So, you know, this is a, 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 a you know, a university or college, but each one in here, everybody in here, you got to dig deeper, you know, are you in fraternities or sororities when you were in college or, you know, or, or what were your parents, you know, what's, what is your extended family? What, age group are you in and do you have grandchildren you know so that's another <laughs> element and so always digging deeper into what our experiences in life um and and looking at the intersectionality i was in this other workshop and this one uh white woman she said oh you know but i tried so hard to diversify my network and so i joined the NAACP and I felt really uncomfortable. And so I went over to this uh, woman's group and I said, okay. And then what did you do after that? Oh, well, I just did a lot of things with this woman's group and it was wonderful. And so we were able to move forward. And I asked her, I said, and so what does the women's group have in common with the NAACP? And she's like, what do you mean? I said, what do you have in common with them? And she said, well, I don't know. I said, you have women in common. <laughs> with them, <laughs> you have women. <laughs> so now that you're with this women's group, hey, let's do something together for Women's History Month, you know, and let's do it. And so it's about like breaking out of what is my siloed way of thinking about myself and the people around me and opening that up. What are the intersectionalities? You know, so yeah, you saw people that had nothing to do with the environment, but they were about social justice. Some of them had nothing to do. It was just purely Latino, you know, and some others was gardening, you know, so there was like all kinds of, all kinds of people but we were looking at what was that little thing that was in common um and and birds you know like that that is a very like okay this is that oh but the um the one planet uh is it one planet one earth films they had a film on birds and <laughs> And so we were like, let's get them, ask them if they want to be a part of this. And so, you know, it's just opening it up um, to every possible aspect of that. Um, and then and then another uh, uh, sponsor was the Baha'i community, you know, and one of the principles are justice. One of the things are, you know, climate um, and uh, environmental stewardship, you know, so just digging into like, where where does it but again that goes to what reverend catherine said before that's a lot of work on the front end to know this about all these people to be able to call on them and say hey i think you all would be interested in this i love that i love that so much um we're getting close to the end of our time together and melvin i see that you have your hand up so i wonder melvin would you like to ask our final question and then we can discuss a little bit before we turn to announcements I uh, surely can. Thank you so much. This was a fascinating conversation. Uh, you said something about conflict earlier when one of the um, those five pillars are not, you know, uh, addressed. Uh, conflict arises. So, 
can you speak a little bit to navigating the choppy waters of otherness and difference? Because um, when I think about, because a lot of the concepts you talked about can equally be applied to, you know, other leaders who are not as open and all of that. So can you talk a little bit how you navigate um, difference, conflict, and otherness and moving from a um, melting pot approach to a mixed solid approach? That is an excellent question, um, <laughs> which I hope I hope to find the answer to one day in my life. <laughs> but for right now, what I can what I can offer that I've seen um, just in my experiences is that you know sometimes if I'm able, so say there's a, a leader that doesn't exemplify these things, and everybody kind of bows down to this person and doesn't move forward unless we have their okay and you know and and is very and, and this person is very territorial so you're not really moving in a space that you can be yourself um so probably five of the five principles are all crossed off not even on the table and so what what i have to ask myself is do i want to be in this space is this where I want to put my energy? Um, because if you're constantly fighting against what your energy, what, what the surrounding energy is, you're not able to fulfill what your purpose is because you're putting your energy towards the wrong thing. And that is just to change the environment. Now, if the changing the environment is your goal, then by all means do that. And so when you have that person that doesn't allow for the core principles to be in place, then you have to play into it, right? So now you have to play into that person's ego and phrase everything as a question versus saying, this is my idea. So now instead of saying, you know, I'd like to contribute this and blah, 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 blah it now turns into, what do you think about this idea and does that fit in with your plan you know and so it's it's about crafting things differently so that it always adheres to their plan and and so now you're thinking okay i gotta get them to buy into this but they have to think that it's their plan and their idea so if you're willing to go that route then by all means do that, but you have to play the field quite differently than being transparent, being open, and, you know, and 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 all the other things that I was talking about. So you do have to question: Do I want to be in this space? And if so, I I, I got to play differently. I hope that helped. I'm still I'm still trying to understand that one. That's such a good question. Most of the times I just leave. <laughs> I'm like, this is this is some bull and I'm not dealing with this. <laughs> I hear that, Tina. I hear that. <laughs> Pick your battles. Um, Pick your yeah. battles. Yeah, well, I want to thank you so much for being with us today, Saida. There are even more questions in the chat that we weren't able to get to, um, which is just a sign that this is great, robust discussion. Um, and um